Sherry and I'm your ARRA host tonight, that's Sharon Sherry, live from her lounge room. I have the pleasure this evening of uh, interviewing four ARRA members, the lovely Kylie Griffin. Let me tell you a little bit about Kylie, but firstly, welcome Kylie. Hi, how are you going? Good, thank you. Thanks for your time this evening. Now, Kylie Griffin's obsession with all things paranormal and fantasy started at an early age when she used to imagine the jacaranda tree in her front yard was a spaceship used to defend the world from invading enemies. Writing stories seemed a natural extension to her childhood adventures. Today she's a primary teacher sharing her love for the written word with young children. In her spare time she writes and reads all things paranormal. Kylie lives in a small rural village in outback New South Wales, Australia where she volunteers in a number of emergency services organisations in her local community. After the event tonight, you can visit Kylie at her website at www.kyliegriffin.com. And that's the end of our introduction. Kylie, welcome to tonight. Thank you. Be good to be here. So what have you been up to in the last week or so? You've been travelling. I have, yes. I've just uh, come back from um, the Romance Writers of America conference. Uh, that was quite um, large compared to our Australian New Zealand conferences, but it was a real lot of fun, real lot of fun. So you get to catch up with, I guess, your publisher and editors and all those guys who tend those that you don't normally get to see? Yes, yes. It's the first time I've been able to um, actually meet my editor, Lise Peterson, and uh, my agent, Elaine Spencer from the Night Agency, um, other than you know via email, um, and it was really good just to catch up with them face to face, put a name to it, so to speak, and and just uh, talk um, business that sort of thing. So yeah, it was really really good. Great. For those who don't know, the Night Agency is a very very good agency. They are very lucky to have Kylie, but she's lucky to have them also. Now Correct. Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> Some of our viewers, especially Helen, have put in a number of questions around your latest book. But do you want to just tell us a little bit about the series before we get into those questions about your latest book? Uh, tell you a little bit about my latest book or just the series, sorry? Just briefly about the series and then we'll lead into the final one with the questions. Okay. Well, it's the it's called the Light Blade series. It's a fantasy romance um, well, trilogy at the moment. Um, it's got. It's a bit like um, um, a demons versus humans uh, fantasy setting, and uh, unbeknownst to either of them, there are half blood uh, human demons as well. And it's uh, sort of in the style of um, you know the fantasy stories like um, City's Lackey or their Her Heralds of Valdemar series where some of the um, <clears throat> characters have uh, special powers um, and of course you know there's the good versus evil character uh, characters and a war brewing in the, uh, throughout the series and each of the books so far feature um, human, demon and half-blood characters uh, and, their, and their stories, but particularly their romances. Great. Now, of course, these questions, uh, please feel free to answer them in any way you like, and if they lead you off on a tangent, please don't worry, follow it. I'm sure our, leaders, our readers will love to uh, hear from you in whatever way you want to share. So, is there a meaning to Naraish, which is what the demons in your books are called? No, not really. Um, the only the only common thread that you'll see through the um, the names that I've given the demons and the non-demons is the na, the beginning part of the words, and that's just a, a relationship between the the demon ancestry. That's all that really means. Great, thank you. Now the naraish and the nachi have markings similar to tattoos, and they they're in various parts of their bodies. Is there anything that makes these markings have more meaning? Um, no, it's it's just like a, a natural body skin colouring or birthmarks that um, are you know make each species look different. I guess um, it's like you know black skin or white skin or the nice mocha coloured sort of. It's a genetic thing. 
Uh, and it, really the only reason I sort of uh, decided to come up with something like that was just to differentiate, differentiate between humans and demons, other than a few other physical characteristics like, um, you know, the extra super strength and the um, slight fangy type teeth that I've got on the demons. Now I have to admit to only having read the third book and in the first two I may have missed this but uh, physically with the, the Na Chi which of course are half human, half demon, are their markings less prevalent than on the Na Reish? Yeah, they're probably more a lighter colour um, rather than as dark and as prominent as those on the demons. Um, they're still very obviously noticeable. Um, you, you can't hide them as such and they're not you know, really pale or anything. So yeah, they're probably more <clears throat> um, a lighter shade. Right. I love the idea of the sacred lake and I can't, go, I can't wait to go back and read the first two books and, and explore that whole place in much more detail and got a little taste of it through Eric's memories, of course. In, and when they finally got there at the end of the book, but it was uh, just some place I thought that would be fabulous to visit. Now, the heroes and heroines in your stories have unusual names like Arik and Imhara. Where did you find these names? Uh, well, Arik actually comes from Alec, A-L-E-C, and I just played around with the, the letters in the word until I came up with a different sounding name. That was pretty easy, actually. It's probably one of the easiest ones. Um, Amara was, I'm not quite sure where I found her name other than just, again, just playing around with combinations of um, names. I've got some baby name books on the shelf in my um, library and I often flick through the, those, those books and look for uh, names that are unusual and then, again, just play around with the, with the letters and the sounds um, and, you know, say them out loud a million times until I, I come up with something that's um, pleasing to the ear. Great. Now this is a question we I haven't really asked anyone else before, I don't think. When you um, you come up with these names, often a, a character, you're writing it and, and sometimes the, the first name you give it isn't the name they end up with. Has that happened with you? Yes. Yeah. In the... Um um, I'm just trying to remember where I introduced him. I had a character called... Um, uh, now, now I'm going to get it mixed up. <laughs> um, a character called Zorn. Um, I actually called him Vaughn to start with, and then um, I changed it. I didn't like the look of it. Vaughn was too, too. Uh, I mean, I knew I knew a couple of Vaughns uh, here where I live, and I just thought, no, it doesn't look unusual enough, so I just put a Z in front of it. And um, I've actually got the his name mixed up through the three books, and I had a line editor have to pick that up and tell me to change it. So um, as you can see, I'm still mixing it up. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, Vaughn, Zorn, you know, it's close <laughs> enough, I guess. And only a line editor would pick it up, probably. <laughs> now, Helen has asked Kylie, how hard is it to write a sex scene with all of your heroes and heroines? Ah, that's a good question, Helen. Sex scenes are probably the hardest, I find the hardest to write. Give me an action scene or uh, any, you know, I love writing action scenes. It just comes so easily. I see them in my head. I can, it's like a movie playing through my head. But the sex scene, while I can see it in the head, actually physically writing it, because it, I, I guess it's so um, emotional and, and you're trying to portray some sort of character growth through that scene that I, you know, you, you want to get it perfect so you, you spend hours writing any sort of um, sex scene or an intimate scene. So yeah, I find them really, really hard to write. Sometimes it can take me three or four days to just complete a scene. So yeah, they're, they're probably one of the hardest ones I find to write. Wow, I guess at three or four days a scene when you're on deadline we're lucky to get them at all. <laughs> um, your world building is fantastic and I must admit that the, the way you write I can see the place in my head as I read. Do you keep notes or story bibles about your world so that you don't get mixed up and you can keep it going? Absolutely. Um, I never used to keep um, a, like a story bible uh, but with this series because the, the world grew beyond you know obviously book one um, I had to keep track of those sort of things. So I've actually 
got a little book, that, like an A4 book. I don't know whether you can see that there. Yes, we can. Yeah. And then inside it, I've divided it up into each of the books that I've written so far. And um, under little headings, I've put down things like, you know, places, place names, descriptions of those places, character names, minor, major, um, animals, plants, um, political structures, military structures, all those sort of things. And then um, when I complete a book, I sit down and I go through it again and jot down any more details. So I've got a record of what happens in each book and who's related to whom or who did what to whom or what, what happened to a particular place. Like in the third book, there was a, an avalanche towards the end, uh, um, end of the book there. So I've jotted that down so I know that that's, that's happened. All those sort of things are all recorded in there. So not only do I um, keep uh, track of it, but so does my um, uh, line, oh, editor as well. They send me a, uh, what they call a style sheet and they keep the same sort of information as well which is a good thing because often we both miss something and uh, so we've got a sort of a double check system going there. So yeah, definitely need a series Bible to keep track of everything. There you go. For all our readers, that's great for those aspiring writers out there. You heard it from Kylie. Keep that Bible up to date. Yes, now it's really hard, to go, really hard to go back and um, uh, do it after you've done three or four books. It's, it's just way too big a job really is. Now you said before when we were talking about sex scenes that the battle scenes are like action movies in your head. You sounded like you really, really loved them and I guess there's going to be a few more battle scenes in the books coming out after number three. Yep, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it's just like, I mean, I love action movies and, and, and the, the, you know, the really... Um, any anything like that at all, and I guess um, that it's just an extension of it in my head. Um, I can see a battle scene so clearly. Once I know there's one coming, um, my subconscious must go to work on it, even while you know, like while I'm sleeping or something. And then when it comes to actually physically writing that scene, um, it just flows so easily. It's a, it's it's like done, you know. You have some great animals in these stories. I mean, the Vorks are truly scary things. How did you name them? And do you have pictures of what they look like? Have you kind of built them in your head? Or have you got a sticky thing and put them all over a board to make up these fantastical creatures? Um, well, the, the names, again, I, I guess it's just playing around with, with letters and sounds and syllables. And um, you come up with something that's hopefully suitably appropriate and or, you know, um, scary, I don't know, it's not particularly scary, but it just sounds good, Vork. Um, as far as seeing the animals, again, it's just, uh, I see them in my head. Um, I envisaged uh, a Vork being very, um, I suppose the closest thing you could imagine it to be, if anybody's watched Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the beasts that the goblins and the orcs um, ride. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's sort of that sort of, uh, scary creature sort of looking thing. Um, that's as close as I can sort of imagine it. Um, only I, I sort of see it as more a, a uh, gosh, a bison, you know, the, the bison, uh, the wild bison that have got the big shoulders and um, the fur, that sort of thing. Um, sort of a cross between those two animals and um, of course, you know, with the, with the um, carnivorous fangs. So um, I guess, yeah, I, I envisage them as easy, I guess, as I envisage the action scenes. They just seem to happen, appear in the head, I guess. Yeah. Right. There are still lots of secondary characters, you know, from the half-bloods of the Nachi and the humans that we would probably love to see have their own stories. How many more books are you contracted for currently, but how many are in your head to write? Okay, well, at the moment I'm not contracted for any more. Um, but I have at least four others I'd like to write. Um, and yes, there are some secondary characters that you've already met in the first three that are going to appear in these other ones. Um, readers have actually helped me decide on one of the ones um, later on. There's been a, a popular character that they've said, oh, we've got to have a story for her. So um, she's going to have one later down the track. But yeah, at least four others that I can imagine at this point in time. And I've actually written 
uh, two proposals for books four and five, so um, they're sort of ready to roll and ready to write, which which I'll be doing shortly. Great. Well, if you need anyone to do some petitioning on your behalf, let me know. I'm all for it. Um, Kylie, one of the questions I wanted to talk about, well, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the political situation in your book. I love the fact that with the light blades as opposed to the demons, the light blades have an almost even mix of female and male on the council. So it's a much more egalitarian structure than the demons. Was that deliberate or did it just kind of happen or did you do it to, you know, to show the difference in, in the world? Um, I didn't. I don't think I, I just, uh, did it deliberately. I think it might have been more subconscious than anything. Um, I guess it it harks back to um, I read a lot of fantasy growing up, and I mean, again, it, you know, Mercedes Lackey, Anne McCaffrey, Andrew Norton, um, all those authors had very strong uh, female characters in their stories, and I guess I sort of, in a way, I wanted to. <clears throat> um, Rather than have the traditional male-dominated sort of fantasy story, I wanted to have a, a mix of both. I guess so. I guess my subconscious decided to throw in a, a, a mix of both, you know, on the good guy's side, um, and then on, you know, on the on the uh, flip side to sort of contrast that was to have a very um, uh, male-dominated paternal. Um, side with the demons, so um, just to contrast those two. Great, thank you. Now, Carly, before we leave uh, your book, and uh, for those who haven't read, I remind you go to www.kylygriffin.com, look them up and buy them. They're, the first, the third one was absolutely fabulous. Can't wait to read the others. Carly, you're off to RWA in. Fremantle very soon. I think I'll be catching up with you then. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm looking forward to going over to the West. It'll be my first trip over to WA. Um, so I'm really looking forward to going over there. And of course, um, sitting in on the uh, ARA signing. So I'll get to meet a few, no doubt, Western Australian readers. Absolutely. Great. People are looking forward to that. I think they're, they're pretty well subscribed already. So uh, that'll be a great afternoon as they always are no matter where they're held. A couple of mm. questions that have nothing to do with your books per se. This one comes from Mel Teshko. Hi Kylie, I just wanted your viewpoint in regard to agents and subbing to the big six publishers. In this ever-changing industry, do you think mm. agents are a must? Uh, I guess it's a, I mean it, it's a very personal decision for anybody pursuing a writing career. Um, I've always felt that personally that an agent is is handy to have uh, working with you, um, mainly because you know they're the one that'll sort of um, do the uh, interceding for you between you know liaising between the editor and or the publicist uh, and negotiating contracts for you. I mean I'm not a um, a lawyer by any means or a contract um, savvy person, so. Um, I sort of rely on on my agent there to to assist me understanding what contra uh, what the clauses in the contracts mean and to negotiate the best deal possible for me. Um, I know just you know just generally speaking that my agent has been able to um, you know inquire on my behalf of of several things of my editor or my publicist. It's been saving me time uh, having to go back and forth between those two. So you know, in, it, there's many reasons why you should have an agent, uh, but it, it really is dependent on you know where you see your career going. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time at the moment to be a be an author because you know there's there's the traditional publishing, there's self publishing, there's e publishing. So it really is um, probably a matter of working out where you'd like to head as a as an author. And deciding your best, the best steps to take to get you there. And for me, it was actually going via an agent and getting an agent um, to assist me with the traditional publishing. So again, um, yeah, it's just my, it's it's a very personal thing. But I I do think they're worth worth getting an agent and helping you out there. I guess if you have one, it gives you time to write instead of negotiating all the other waters, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it's 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 a very uh, I suppose an efficient way. It keeps you you know doing what you really should be doing, which is writing writing the next book or writing the book that you contracted to do. And they're sort of the um, the person doing the gophering side of things for you and and saving you that time. Yeah. Okay. Couple more questions before I let you go. You mentioned before Mercedes Lackey, Andre Norton. And Anne McCaffrey. Who are your other favourite authors at the moment, or indeed since you started reading? Oh, since I started reading, well, those three. I mean, Anne McCaffrey was one of the first uh, sci-fi fantasy authors I ever picked up. I was actually at a um, a clearing sale as a, I think I was about thirteen, and uh, amongst this box of books was her first book, Dragonflight, and she hooked me into the genre. Um, but other than that, um, I can remember reading when I was in year 10 uh, an author called Rowena Corey Daniels, her TN series, and absolutely falling in love with that world building and, and seeing the element of romance within, within her stories. And then lo and behold, probably about 15 years later, I actually got to meet her at an RWA conference. So. Um, I really, really enjoyed reading her work. Um, these days, oh gosh, there's so many. There's a list long. Um, Nalini Singh, of course, very um, love her series, uh, particularly her Psy Changeling series. Um, Denise Rossetti, she's one of our um, homegrown authors. Love her books, absolutely love her books. Um, gosh, who else? Uh, romance books wise, um, Pamela Palmer, Joss Ware, just recently in the last 12 months I've discovered Kylie Scott. Um, yeah, I mean I could go on forever about all the, all the, the, the um, authors that I enjoy reading. But uh, yeah, I can harken back to Anne McCaffrey, Andrew Norton and uh, Mercedes Lackey in my early days. Okay, my last question for you. If you could have a dinner party, who would be the ideal people around the table for you? <laughs> um, well, definitely Anne McCaffrey. I'd love to chat with her and, and talk about her incredible um, series that she's written, not only just the Dragon series, but the uh, Ship Who Sang series, the, um, uh, I'm just trying to think, the, is it the Hive series? Um, mm -hmm. And the Crystal yep. Yep, The Crystal Singer, uh, all, all her books. I mean, I'll read anything by her. I just love the world building. And the fact that she had more um, character-driven stories rather than the real hard science fiction, um, fantasy, uh, sorry, science fiction stories. <clears throat> so definitely Anne. Um, probably, probably Rowena Corey Daniels because she was the first Australian fantasy romance author I discovered. That was a very significant moment. It was lovely to actually find a, an Australian fantasy fantasy writer. Um, Nalini, uh, again, she's. I've got. A, I've actually a friend made a T-shirt for me that says, "I want to be Nalini Singh when I grow up," and um, that's so true. <laughs> uh, it's just a bit of a fangirl thing. I'd, I'd love to have Nalini there again, just talking to her about her books and her world building. Uh, and then just for fun, um, George Lucas. Um, I grew up, you know, obviously on Star Trek. Uh, sorry, sorry, Star Wars and Star Trek, but um, Star Wars in particular, and fell in love with his world. Um, so yeah, chatting with him about that and having dinner with him. And gosh, uh, oh, how could I forget Hugh Jackman? <laughs> He'd be wonderful to have at the dinner too. <laughs> Yeah, you have a line out the door for that for for waiting for that one, I think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Kylie, if I were to say to you, is there something personal about you that you'd like to reveal to your readers? That you know, that little snippet of something about you they wouldn't know, what would that be? Oh gosh. Um oh, I don't know if it's a particularly big secret, but I do love dragons. And uh, have a slight obsession with cats. Um, if you're a Facebook follower, um, I tend to post a lot of cat things. And then uh, with the dragons, I collect little figurines of dragons. I've got a, um, 
friend who made a stained glass door for me with a dragon on it. So that's my front door now. And of course, when I um, became published, one of my milestone um, uh, rewards was I actually went out and got a tattoo with a dragon on my forearm. So, yeah, there you go. That'll do. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, Carly, that brings us to the end of our interview. I thank you for your time this evening, and I'm sure as this airs, our ARRA members will be delighted to hear from you and learn a little bit more about you and your world that you build. I look forward to chatting with you again and thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me and I look forward to meeting everyone over at Fremantle. Alright, just a final reminder, www.kyliegriffin.com. Go visit and I hope you enjoy this, uh, this film. Good night.